Paul says this, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means, now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. And I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready. I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. Paul longed to go to Rome. It was a passion. It was, it was something that I believe God had put into his heart. He wanted to go there. I wonder this morning if you would just raise your hand and say, there, there's something out there that I want. There's something that I'm, that I'm longing for God to do in my life. Is there anybody other than me? There's a, there's a, there's a lot of you. There you go. All right. Well, I want to encourage you this morning. If God has placed that in you, He'll perform it. But I also want to challenge you and caution you to recognize that God doesn't always take the path that you plug in to your GPS. He will place something in your heart like this when you're a teenage boy saying, God, do whatever you've got to do to make me the man you want me to be. No. What a prayer, right? We think, that's a great prayer to pray such a prayer. And I had all these grandiose ideas of how God was going to do that. And recalculating, recalculating, right? What? <laughs> Paul got to go to Rome. But not the way that I'm sure he expected it. Now listen, if you're born again this morning, you are on your way somewhere. You are on a journey to a glorious destination. But don't lose heart if the way there seems difficult. I want to remind you this morning that sometimes God uses bad things to bring about the best things. If I wrote my story, I would stay on the mountain. The breeze wouldn't be too hard or too soft. It would be just right so that I wouldn't perspire at all. You know, just climate control and I would watch eagles soaring by in the clouds making all kinds of different shapes and I would just sit there comfy cozy everything would be great now listen I've had many mountaintop experiences in my life some of which like Peter I've said Lord it is good for us to be here Let's build a tabernacle. Let's stay right here. And then God came along and pounded the mountains into valleys and said, Gordon, come, follow me. And I'm like, Lord, that looks a lot like the valley of the shadow of death to me. Oh, it is, it is. It absolutely, uh, well, is there another valley, right, that we could, <laughs> Paul is writing to the Philippians 
this wonderful letter of joy. Of joy. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, making request with joy. He says, I'm joyful because of the fellowship we have in the gospel. He says, you are partakers together in my grace. And he says, what a wonderful thing that is. In our last study, we looked at that, the, the fellowship of the gospel. Today, we're going to look at the furtherance of the gospel. How does the gospel go forward. If you're jotting down notes, if you like outlines like I do to kind of keep your thoughts in order, we're going to look at Paul's chains, Paul's critics, and then Paul's crisis, which is not what you would expect his crisis to be. So we pick up our study in verse 12. Paul says, I would you should understand, brethren. He's writing to these Philippians and he says, you need to understand this. You need to understand it. You, you need to get this. Don't miss this, Paul says. That the things which happened unto me have fallen out, rather, unto the furtherance of the gospel. Now, remember in our introduction, we... We talked about Acts chapter 16, and it was there that, you know, Paul was trying to go north, he was trying to go south, the Holy Spirit was saying, no, 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 and then finally he had a vision, a man saying, come over to Macedonia and help us, and he shows up there in Philippi. He doesn't find that man that was in his vision, but he finds a group of women down by the riverside praying, one of whom was Lydia, and God opened her heart to the gospel. And then she opened her house to Paul and his companions. And then Paul used that as a home base to, to begin to preach the gospel. And then there was a demoniac damsel there who was just disrupting everything until finally Paul was grieved in his spirit and he rebuked the devil, delivered this young lady from demonic possession, and wow, everything changed. The people who made money because of her soothsaying dragged them into the marketplace, called upon the magistrates. They were beaten. They were delivered to a Philippian jailer who threw them under the prison, locked them up in stocks. And you know the rest of the story. Paul and Silas just whined, pouted, murmured, complained, hashtag ministries over, you know, they got on social media and just said, please, donate to my GoFundMe. You know, life has just ended as we know it. No, that's not what happened. Paul and Silas was there in prison. And I don't know which one was praying and which one was praising or if they were taking turns. But man, oh man, they began to praise the Lord, pray to the Lord. And the place was shaken so much so that every man's chains fell off. The prison shook, the doors flung open. The jailer comes running in with sleepy stuff in his eyes, ready to take his own life because he knew that's what would happen to him anyway if all of these prisoners escaped on his watch. Paul says, no, 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 don't you do that. He said, sirs, what, what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved and your house. He gets saved, the whole house gets baptized. They wash up in Dr. Paul and, and Silas's wounds and, and they had a grand time rejoicing. Then a message was sent saying, hey, you need to let these guys go. And Paul says, oh, no, 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 you don't. You guys beat us openly and publicly being Romans, ruh row. Without a trial. Paul says, no, 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 no. You tell them to come. Themselves. Look us in the white of our eyes. God delivered Paul from prison. And now he's sitting in prison in Rome. And he's writing this letter to the people who knew of, experienced, witnessed God's great deliverance in Paul's life. And yet now, 
He's sitting in prison. Maybe many of them are praying, Lord, do it again. Do it again, Lord. Shake the prison. Lord, let the chains fall off of our brother Paul. Release him. Let him go. And Paul says, you need to understand, brothers and sisters, God's doing something different this time. Because the things that have fallen out, notice he doesn't say, I'm falling apart. How many of you have ever fallen apart? Yeah. I'm a professional, by the way. If you ever need help in falling apart, it just, just give me a call. I'm really, really good at it. We just make it really dynamic and dramatic, and we can just fall apart together, right? Wow. Misery loves company, they say. Paul says, I'm not falling apart. This is falling out. This is just falling out just like God wants it. It's fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel. That Greek word there is the word that was used by the Romans when they would clear brush and debris making the Roman roads that would enhance and promote and advance the Roman Empire. I love these words that Paul is using in this letter. It's like he's hijacking all of these words to write to these saints that are, remember, in a Roman colony, who's used to this propaganda and rhetoric and these words, you know, making the way for the Roman Empire. I'm sure there were banners and, you know, make Rome great again and, you know, we're going to take back the soul of Rome, you know, and both sides are, you know, all of this stuff was happening and Paul was hijacking these words to help this church understand something. He said, this has all happened to clear the way for the kingdom of Christ. God is using this to mow down the debris the brush, all of the things to make a smooth way for the gospel. Remember, the euangelion, the good news of the king. There's a new king on the throne, Paul says. Could you imagine? Paul's there in prison, and in prison I've never been. I hope I never go. But, but, but people who have been there say there's conversations. You know, it's like, hey, so what are you in here for? <laughs> This one says this, this one says that. And Paul says, well, I'm in here because I don't believe that Caesar is the Savior. I don't believe that his name is above every other name. I don't believe that his name is the name in which we're going to be saved. You ought to try that sometime. I tried that right after 2020. <laughs> Ooh, you get in trouble. I don't believe that Joe Biden is the answer for America. Look out. I don't believe that Donald J. Trump is the answer for America. Look out. I believe that Jesus Christ and only him is the answer for this country. Now listen. Listen. There's Paul. This one, I'm in here for murder. I'm in here for that. I'm in here for this. I'm in here for that. Paul doesn't say it, but what he's really saying is, I'm in here for treason. Because I pledge my allegiance to another king, and his name's not Nero. Paul, you need to be quiet, brother. You're, you're stirring up trouble, right? We're, we're going to have to go to another church that's a little bit more somber, and a little bit more careful because, because you're going to stir up trouble and, and people are going to hear these messages online and, and we're going to have problems. Sorry. Paul, you're going to have to tame it down, brother. Did you know, Paul, have you heard that this man is taking Christians and tying them up on stakes and covering them in wax and lighting them as candles in his garden? Paul, don't you know that it's getting rough out there for people who claim to be followers of the way? Paul, have you heard? They're saying that a lot of stuff that you guys believe is hate speech. 
They're saying that some of this stuff that you claim is, is a crime, like, like there's only two genders. Like saying that a man was born a man, he is a man, he always will be a man, and he'll die a man. And 200 years from now, another generation will dig him up from the ground and look at his DNA and will know without skin, without dress, without anything, that is a man. Because that's the way that God did it. But Paul, you need to tame it down because that kind of rhetoric is what got you in here to begin with. We pray prayers like, Lord, send revival. Revive us again, Lord. We pray prayers like, God, turn this nation around. And then we go to political rallies and say, that's God's answer up on the stage. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. And I know that makes people mad. You say, well, Gordon, what happened to your political views? Most of them haven't changed at all. I just don't believe that that's the answer. So Paul says, I'm in here because I believe that Jesus Christ is the king. And I believe that his kingdom is coming. You see, remember, that's what got Jesus on the cross. Do you remember the, remember the religious people? Oh, Lord, help me. You remember what the religious people in Jesus' time were saying? We have no king but Caesar. Gordon, you talked about this last week. Move on, move on. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe we don't need to move on. But it's interesting that God's people have been crying out for a man king ever since the days of Samuel. And God told them what he would do, what each and every one of them would do. And yet, can you hear them? That evangelical choir, hail, hail, Caesar, hail, hail, Caesar. Yes. Yes. But you guys need to understand, Paul says, that all this is happening so that the gospel, the euangelion, the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to move forward. I'm excited. Verse 13, so that my bonds, my chains in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. Who would have thought, what if, what if, what if, what if your pain, what if your prison is God's plan to bring about his purpose of furthering the gospel in your life. I wonder if that would be okay. I wonder if that would fit in our, our, our faith manual. I know a lot of your stories. I know what a lot of you are going through right now. And many of you would say, I'm done. <laughs> I'm out, right? <laughs> eject, eject, eject. What if? What if what you're going through? What if what you're experiencing right now has been God's plan all along. What if the loss that you're experiencing, the contention that you're going through with some other person, what if the financial trouble that you're having, what if the pain in your body, the sickness, the tiredness, what if, what if all of that, what if your depression, your anxiety, what if all of those things was a part of God's plan to further His gospel in your life? See, we don't typically think that way. But God says, remember through Isaiah, my thoughts. So this morning, I wonder if God's trying to say, church, let's, let's elevate our thinking. What did Paul just say in verse 12? You need to understand this, brothers and sisters. You need to understand this. You got to get this. These bonds are breaking barriers. <laughs> These chains 
are God's answer. Paul says, I've been praying to go to Rome. Now, scholars tell us that Paul may have sat here in this situation for up to four years. <laughs> what? But here's what's interesting. Spoiler alert, chapter 4, verse 22, Paul's doing his typical greetings at the end of his letters, and he says, the saints are greeting you. And he says, those saints in Caesar's household. What? Nero's house is experiencing revival? Let me tell you what we need to do. We need to vote that man that's in there out. And we need to get our man in there. And that's going to solve the problem. No, what we need to do is get on our knees. Why is it that the church's plan of action is never, let's pray that God would save the man that's in there right now and change his heart and change his perspective and change his direction. Could he not? Has he not? Have we forgotten Nebuchadnezzar? You need to know, he says, church, that these things are happening so that God's agenda gets done. Has the church fallen asleep and forgotten that God has an agenda? Have we forgotten that, that this chapter is about rejoicing in Christ's service with a single mind? And our memory verse is what? Yes, and what, is it? what does it say? Ooh, we, we're going to give out some prizes on this side of the room. <laughs> Next week now. We, we will <laughs> Paul says these bonds are making a difference. Now, so here's, here's what scholars tell us. That Paul was, was stuck there, locked up. And four times a day, a soldier would have a shift there with Paul. Now, these weren't any ordinary soldiers. This was the Praetorian Guard, the Imperial Guard of Rome. This was the elite of the elite. Augustus started this with, with 10,000 of these soldiers. They were, they were savvy politically, but savage when it come to war. They were called king makers. These were the movers and the shakers. These were the ones that make... Uh, Ah, well, I'm not even going to compare them with anything that we have. These guys, these guys were the best of the best of the best of the best. And I wonder, you know, if you're going to let your mind wander and imagine, start doing it with good stuff, right? I wonder if those guys were like doing rock, paper, scissors. It's like, I don't want to go back in there, man. All this guy does He's just, he's talking about a different king, and I just feel uncomfortable just sitting there. He's, he's writing all these letters, and he's talking about a, a king and, a, and a, another you and Gellion, and it's like, I feel treasonous just sitting next to, why do I got to do it? Okay, come on, two out of three. <laughs> but apparently, apparently some of these men sitting there, as Paul says, you know, I, I know that you've pledged your allegiance to Caesar, and I know all of the mythology about him and his father and all of that, but do you really, listen, listen, there's, there's another king whose name was Jesus. You can talk to some of, of your, own, your own soldiers and your own, your, your own enlisted men. As a matter of fact, there were men that were there on Golgotha who had watched countless men crucified. And the one who was standing there driving the spear, he was blown away at this man who died when he chose to die. And his very testimony is this, surely this was the son of God, not Caesar. We know that he is the savior. 
You know, you know the propaganda. You know the payoff that you, you guys, some of your other buddies were made who were there to make a watch that Pilate set up at the tomb. You know the lies that you were told to tell CNN and Fox News and in, 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 you know what I'm trying to say. All those other ones, you know that stuff. And they just ran with it, hook, line, and sinker, and told everybody those lies. But I have seen him. I was on my way on the road to Damascus when a light brighter than the noonday sun shined about me and I heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And you've heard about me. I'm sure you've looked at the, the paperwork and the charges. I persecuted that way until I met this king. And some of them sat there, men who have stared down the face of legions and battles and the clanging of swords and the glittering of spears and the horse hoofs and the bloody cries of men losing their lives in battle. These men shaking, quaking as the Holy Spirit was moving on their life. And they leave that shift and they're never more the same. And somehow through some of these men in this Praetorian guard are talking. What do you think about that guy? Isn't he crazy? He's talking that stuff with me. I know, but man, there's something different about him. You'll have to admit. I've never met another man in chains like this man. I've never met a man go through what he's going through and have this kind of attitude. Doesn't this man know that he's, appear, he's appealed to Caesar? And doesn't he know that he's, he stands a chance of losing his life for treason as he stands before Nero claiming this stuff? I've never met a man like that. And I've been around brave men before. conversations with those giving chemo to believers and radiation anesthesiologists who are about to put the sleepy juice in listening to believers praying before they go out not knowing what God's going to do loved ones and pastors and brothers and sisters walking into bedsides and hospital rooms praying over loved ones and lost ones you need to understand, Paul says, that all of this has fallen out rather for the furtherance of the gospel. These chains, they haven't bound anything. And when he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, Paul says that all this stuff that's happened to me, but the word of God is not bound. I, I need to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> I just love to get excited up here this morning. He says, it's manifest in all the palace. Everybody's talking about how that brother is going through what he's going through. What an if this morning that what you're going through, you would surrender it to Christ today. I don't know, maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your home life. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's your finances. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But what and if all those people that are in the circle of that goings on would see a brother or a sister submit to God's plan, accept it, and say, Lord, thy will be done. I did a funeral yesterday, and I was talking to the funeral director there, and he was telling me of a, of a tumor that he had, and it was attached to his eye, and different people were like, wow, what in the world? Doesn't this worry you, and doesn't it bother you? And he's like, no, because I just accept the fact that if God allowed it, he's got a plan for it. What if your disappointments this morning are really God's appointments? And, and what if you're missing it? What if I'm missing it? And what if God has us right now reading this book of joy for this very reason? For you and I to understand what the Lord wanted the Philippians to understand. That all this stuff is God's plan. And I'm falling apart instead of watching it fall out. Somebody hold my mule while I shout. <laughs> 
Look what he says in verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds. He says, not only is the gospel making its way through the Praetorian Guard into the palace of Caesar and into the household of Caesar, that's what's happening in here. But there's even more happening out there. There are brothers and sisters who are learning of what I'm doing. And they're saying, wait a minute. Hey, you know what? Deke, you know what? Uh, Ron, do you know what? David, you know what? If Paul can do it in there, then surely... We can do it out here. I don't know if you've ever been in any kind of sports or any kind of stuff, and you, and you watch these people that are just the elite of the elite, right? And I mean, they're marathon runners. They're, they're all of this. Have you ever said to yourself, listen, if he can run 12 more miles, then surely I can run one more? Hopefully there are believers in your life and around you who say, wait, wait, if he reads that many chapters every day, then I can at least read one. If that sister knows all of those Bible verses, then maybe at least I can, I, I can get back to memorizing John 3, 16. And do you know the writer of Hebrews says that's why we're supposed to be coming together? To spur each other on, to encourage and provoke one another. You got this, John. You can do this. You got this, Dirk. You can do this. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, Brad. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And Paul says, so not only is the gospel making its way into Caesar's palace, I got brothers out there that are waxing bold. They're like, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's take this place by storm. What if all of us Christians would just... Step out of politics. And step into prayer. I'm not saying change your political persuasion. I, I, don't, I don't care about that. I'm not saying change who you're going to vote for. That's your business. You go in that ballot box, that's between you and God. Do your thing, chicken wing. But what I'm saying is, set all that garbage aside. There's plenty of that rhetoric out there, right? Rome's going to promote its rhetoric. They've got their own euangelion. They're preaching that loud and proud. Did you catch what I did? Pro okay. What if, what if we would get proud of our king? What if we would get proud of the truth? What if we would become proud of the man who hung on that cross between two thieves who took my sin to the grave? and rose without it and granted me eternal life, what would happen? Here's what would happen. I believe we would turn this world upside down just like the early church did. But I don't know if I'm going to be able to, but maybe, maybe, just like Paul, maybe I'll, I'll inspire some of you to say, if he can do it, I know I can. If, Gord, if that dude can do it, he can't count past him. I had to tell the band this morning, we were trying to decide how many times we were going to do a bridge. And I said, look, I only got one more finger left, right? So y'all just calm down, right? Because I might get confused. <laughs> if he can do it, Paul's not in that situation, but they're waxing confident, he said. Now, verse 15, it gets a little interesting. He says, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. That Did you hear that little? I love when God, it's perfect timing. People think, oh no. God uses it. Some are preaching of strife and contention, of envy. Now we're told in the Gospels that Pilate understood that it was for envy that Jesus was crucified. You see, there were some preachers out there in Paul's day who were trying to get everybody in town to fill their church. And they weren't so much concerned whether it was people being born, born again. They, were, they, were, they would gladly steal them. <laughs> oh, you need, to, you need to come over here. <sighs> we've got a better light show and we got better smoke and we got professional bands and wow. There were actually brothers out there 
who thought, this is my chance. Paul was sucking the oxygen out of the room. This man came out of nowhere. And he just was just, God just, like a, like a rocket ship, just launched him into the stratosphere. And now he sits in prison. Goody, goody, goody. This is my chance. This is my opportunity to get a little of the spotlight. Now I know there's no preachers like that in Pensacola. We don't have to worry about that being in churches these days. There's no competition. Not at all. It's not about numbers. When when they gather all together for their little conventions, they don't talk about how many are you running? Or how many are you running? Or, or, you know, how many square footage is your edifice? Or I bet my steeple's taller than your steeple. That's the kind of thing that Paul was dealing with. And some of goodwill, he says. Not all of them, right? It wasn't everybody. He says, I'm I'm getting news. I'm hearing about all the people that are preaching out there because, because I'm in here. He says, verse 16, uh, oh, we got to get this. This is, oh. The one preached Christ of, of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add to my bonds. There are guys that are actually out there preaching and trying to stir up trouble to make it worse for me in here, Paul says. That's their motive. They're preaching the gospel to cause me harm. Verse 18, no, verse 17. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. So, so there's, there's two groups of people out there preaching the gospel, Paul says, and he says, what then? Well, I tell you what, I'm gonna sit around here and mope for the rest of my time in prison because have you heard what they believe over there? Have you heard the kind of music they use? I don't know if you've looked at Christian type things on YouTube, but there are hundreds, if not thousands of YouTubers who are are doing fairly well financially. And all they do is criticize other Christian people for the way they do stuff. There are preachers who, look, and I believe pastors and and worship teams, they can make decisions like, you know what, we're not going to use that kind of music or we're not going to use this song because it doesn't line up biblically or, look, to each his own with that. But, But they're not just okay with doing that. They'll go on YouTube or on live television or broadcast and they'll say, Nobody in this church ought to listen to anything that Elevation puts out. Because their doctrine is evil. It's wicked. They're twisted. Have you heard some of the crazy stuff those people believe? Now look, you can leave Solomon's porch, but don't you go to that church down the street now. Ain't no telling what happened in that church down there. And them, them some crazy people over there. They believe all kinds of crazy stuff. You never know what might happen in one of them services. You just go anywhere you want to go, but don't you dare go down there. Don't go down there. Don't go over here. Those people believe that Jesus is, is going to rapture his church before the tribulation. Don't go over there. These people believe that he's going to rapture the church in the middle of the tri- tribulation. And especially not those people down on the corner. That they, they, they believe that it's going to be after it's all said and done. Don't go over there because those people only believe in the sovereignty of God. They, they don't believe man even has a choice. God's deciding everything. Don't go over there. Those people don't even believe in God's sovereignty. They're crazy people over there. They believe it's all man and it's all up to you. If it is to be, it's up to me. Paul says some are preaching of strife and contention. Some of goodwill. Some are trying to add trouble to me. Some are doing it out of love. What then, he says, how should I respond to this? I love this. Notwithstanding in every way, whether in pretense or whether in truth, Christ is preached. Wow. 
while this group over here is pointing fingers at that group over there and talking about how terrible they are and the terrible job they're doing and they ought not do it that way with that melody or those instruments or th and this group over here is saying that group over there shouldn't do it like this they got to hold their mouth a little bit different they got to wear a different kind of clothing Paul says hey shh and everybody kind of gets quiet and looks and Paul says is not Christ being preached Oh, I guess he's got a point there. In the days of the Reformation in the Catholic Church, Martin Luther was stirring everything up. What they would do, the papacy would, would take a lot of, of that new doctrine, that, that doctrine that they were coming about, and they would write it down and they would duplicate it no joke, this is what happened historically. And they would send it to all of the princes so that they would read it and refer back to what they thought about this new doctrine. And guess what was happening? People were reading it and going, hey, wait a minute, that kind of sounds like the Bible. And lives were being changed. Paul says, listen, Christ is being preached. Well, what about them people who stand on the street corner? I saw them this weekend. They had their hair up in a bun. All the ladies wearing dresses. They had them signs. And that guy's just yelling, screaming, hollering. I had to roll my window up. Makes me feel uncomfortable. They shouldn't do that. That ain't the way to do it. That ain't the way to do it. You don't know how many people have gotten saved by that screaming preacher on the street corner. Why don't you just leave that to the screaming preacher on the street corner between him and his master? Besides, I don't know about you, but I've got enough stuff that my master has put on my, my docket that I don't have time to worry about what that guy's doing right there. Maybe God hadn't called me to stand on the street corner and scream like him, but maybe God has called him. Have I ever thought, maybe, just maybe, now, yeah, I know I know everything. But there might be, I don't know, it's far-fetched to think that there might be one thing that slipped past me, but, but, but maybe there is a chance that that one thing slipped past me and God has that guy doing that. Paul says, Christ is being preached. Now look, he doesn't stop there. Look what he says, the rest of the verse. And I therein do rejoice. You guys are arguing about what music to do and what music not to do, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, you know, Calvinist, Arminianist, you know, is, is tongue still for today or is tongues not for today? Are there the gifts of the Holy Spirit or are they not gifts of the Holy Spirit? And what about prophecy? And what about personal prophecy? And what about Christ is being preached and Paul says, I'm rejoicing. I'm rejoicing. You know, I asked a question one time. I got saved in, in a church that, that I don't believe lined up with the Bible. <laughs> but isn't it interesting? that God Almighty, the maker of the universe, my Savior and Lord, chose that place. No, he didn't, Gordon. No, he didn't. Don't say it. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. He chose that messed up place, preaching stuff that didn't line up with this book. He chose that place. He chose that Wednesday night to save me. And, and he had me stay there, listen, wait for it, for 19 years. 19 years. When I left that place, I didn't leave on good terms, but, you know, God is on the throne. When I left, I thought, Lord, why? I, I asked this. I was like, why, Lord? Why did you have me? Because he, he, he moved me from that place to a place that taught the Bible verse by verse. And in that first year of verse by verse, I felt like I learned more than I had learned in all of the 19 years that I had prior to that. And I was like, Lord... What if you would have saved me in this place? What might it look like if I would have been under this teaching for 19 years? But therein, Paul says, I rejoice. But he doesn't stop there. Look what he says. And will rejoice. I'm rejoicing right now, and I'm going to keep on rejoicing. <laughs> Well, what about that church down the street? Praise God. Praise God. And you know what? And such were some of you. 
Many of you got saved in places and you're like, wait a minute, why in the world? But you know what? A lot of people leave Solomon's Porch and other churches looking for the perfect church. And, and, and it's a joke, you've heard it before, but we say to them, if you find it, don't go. If you leave here in search of the perfect church and you find the perfect church, do not walk into that place because you're going to mess it up. Because you ain't perfect. <laughs> I know you think it and I think it, but we are not. What an attitude. Listen, church, this is what joy does. This is what a single mind looks like. This is what it means when we rejoice in the service of Christ. I ain't worried about my boss yelling at me, which my boss don't, but don't be haters. <laughs> there are people who think they're my boss. They yell at me, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> But, but it doesn't matter if I'm yelled at. It doesn't matter if I'm liked. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if eight people show up on Wednesday night or 800. It don't matter. Right? This is what happens. I'm rejoicing. And I will rejoice. Jesus says, I've told you these things that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full but I think we're looking at things the wrong thing the wrong way because mindset has a lot to do with it we have, a, have to have a single mind we, we ain't like them people down there no way oh you better run praise God well Gordon I heard they just take the Bible nobody in the congregation's even got one can you believe it and they get together and he gets up there and he reads one scripture just one. And then he talks about all kinds of stuff for, for 20 minutes. He sing a song and walk out the door. Can you believe it? Okay, rewind that tape back and tell me, what, what does he do? Well, he opens his Bible and he only reads, reads one verse. Praise God. He read one verse. Don't you think God can save someone with one verse? Let's see. I think there's someone in this congregation. Yes, that's it. He was a suicidal jailer. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thine house. One verse. I rejoice and will rejoice. Now, if you want to gather after service with Sister Spookenbacher, and y'all want to cackle about what they're doing down the street or we're going with it. I'm going to join my brother Paul because he's got something that I don't see a lot of in my life. Because I'm not sitting in prison having four different soldiers rotating every single day of my life. Year after year waiting and wondering. How many of you like waiting? Okay. Especially when you're waiting for something bad. Like when you're with a lot of people and you're not really into roller coasters, but everybody in your group's into roller coasters. And you don't want to be the only one that stands out and waits for everybody to get off the roller coaster. So there you are in line. And everybody's laughing and cutting up and joking and talking about the people that are walking by. And you're sitting there dreading and your mind is going to some dark, dark, dreadful places. And then somebody, somebody behind a couple people in your, in your group says, hey, I read that 20 years ago somebody died on this ride. You know, and, and you're just like, oh, and, and, and you're building up, right, for what's coming. Or, or how about this, when, when you've had tests done at the doctor and you're sitting there in the waiting room and your appointment was... At 11.30 and it's now 11.47. And most likely it's just because the doctor's running behind a little bit. But, but in your mind you're thinking, oh, it means it's going to be bad news. They're, 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 they're looking at the reports again. They want to make sure before they tell me what's, what's coming. Paul's sitting there awaiting a trial with Nero. And he does not know if his life's going to be executed or not. In Mark's gospel, three times, Jesus predicts the cross. You tracking with me? Three times, he says, the Son of Man's going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. He's going to be mocked and scourged and crucified. And the writer of Hebrews says this. Listen, you got to get this. Listen, the writer of Hebrews says, who for the joy that was set before him. 
He's not in line going, I'm one day closer to the cross. I'm one day closer to that cross. I wonder what that feels like. There's already been 43 men crucified this year, and I know my day's coming. I'm one day closer to this cross. No, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Paul says, I rejoice and I will rejoice. For I know, verse 19, that this shall turn out to my salvation. I'm saved, by the way. And I'm being saved. And I'm going to be saved. As a matter of fact, ever since I turned 15 years old and accepted Jesus as my Savior, my life story is that of salvation. Every sickness that I had, the speeding tickets that I had, which that wasn't God's plan, but Romans 8, 28's got me covered. <laughs> right? God's not, not necessarily planning all the bad stuff in our lives, but we've got that promise that he's going to work it together for good. And if we'll have this single mind like, like Paul has, we can be like one of our Old Testament brothers who spent some years in prison. His name was Joseph. They ask him, what are you in here for? Nothing. That's what they all say. No, I'm serious. Nothing. I ain't do nothing. I'm innocent. Yeah, I know. Everybody in here is innocent, bro. No, I really mean that. I am. He says, you guys meant it for evil. Genesis 50, verse 20, but God, God meant it for good. He said, this is going to turn out for my salvation. Look what he says. Through what? Through your prayer. Wait, wait. Now, I can't explain this to you in words, church, but there's a beautiful, mysterious, miraculous thing that's happening in this thing we call prayer. Scholars debate over whether or not, okay, if it's God's will, is prayer going to change that? And can prayer change God's mind? And they've been arguing about that, and they're going to continue to argue about that. Here's what I believe. I believe the Bible teaches that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, we have the petition that we made known unto him. So right, we have the scripture to know what is God's will, so I can know how I ought to pray for you. So unless the Holy Spirit has told me otherwise, if you, you ask me to pray for you and you have an illness or a sickness, I'm praying that God will heal you. But I don't know unless the Holy Spirit tells me otherwise that he's going to heal you, I don't know for sure that that's going to happen. So not only do I pray for your healing, I pray, Lord, whatever it is that you're trying to teach this dear saint through this, I ask that they would get it. I ask that you would draw them to yourself in ways that they have never experienced and their minds could not comprehend. He said, this is going to turn out to my salvation through your prayer. And not just your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, in Romans 8, we're told that the Holy Spirit is interceding for me. Right? So, wow, wait a minute. This is, this is, this is crazy, right? God's got a plan. God's got a plan, and he's got a purpose, and he's working, and he's working everything together for good. And God Almighty, the creator and maker of heaven and earth, the King of kings and Lord of lords, says, Gordon, you want to get in on this? You want to get in on this? Wait a minute. But, but, but you're having, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You guys are in a board meeting. I, I, I don't want to, I, I don't belong in there. I remember that's kind of what happened to me in my second phase of ministry. I was, I was uh, working at the playground at a church, and as a playground monitor, I didn't even volunteer. My wife volunteered me. And I'm sitting there early before the first service, before kids start showing up and playing. And I'm just sitting there and sitting there. And one of the pastors walks up and says, hey, won't you come pray with us? Now, I didn't know who us was. I knew he was a pastor, but I didn't know who the rest of the us was. And so, so I walk into the kitchen after him, and I walk into a room filled with pastors. And I'm like, this is odd. Why did I get invited to this prayer meeting? Now, I didn't know, and I don't even think he knew. Maybe he did know. God had a plan. It wasn't long that I was, I was supposed to be in that room. For a couple months, I was in that room, and I wasn't technically supposed to be there because nobody else was in there that wasn't officially a pastor. But here I am, sitting around this table with, with seven or eight other pastors. But it's kind of like that, right? You get Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they're, they're in this board meeting. They're, they're discussing. They're looking there. And, and God says, hey, Gordon, 
get in on this. Yes, you, Gordon. You? Yes, you. Okay, Lord, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in your word and I wanna, I wanna get schooled up on, on what your will is because I, if I'm gonna be in, in on this, and I don't know how this is gonna work, but I know you're inviting me in on it, right? Paul says, I know this is gonna turn out to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit. Paul somehow is saying that the prayers of the saints in Philippi were gonna have an impact on what happened in his life. Now, he doesn't explain it and tell us how that's gonna happen, but he says that it's gonna happen. And I'm telling you this to encourage you to pray. To pray like you've never, ever prayed before. Pray, and when you run out of what to pray, the supply of the Spirit. Because Paul says, when we don't know what to pray as we ought. So when you run out of your prayer list, don't say amen and get up. Linger a bit. Linger a bit and see if you could pick up on one of the individuals in the boardroom. who's having this conversation about what he's doing in the lives of his people and around the world. And you might just hear the Holy Spirit say, hey, what about this? That's some good stuff, church. I don't know. I don't know about you, but if that doesn't encourage you to pray, I don't know what will. That God Almighty is inviting you to the prayer meeting. Bear with me. You know what I'm trying to say. I, I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, misguiding you, but that's, that's what I believe Paul is saying here. He says, according to my earnest expectation. Ooh, that word. God changed my life with that word. Expectation. In the Greek, it's apokaradokia. Apokaradokia. That sounds like a children's poem or nursery rhyme. Apokaradokia. My earnest expectation. What this literally, this word literally means is a person who's a spectator at an athletic event. It means to be on the edge of your seat, neck stretched out, eyes bulging, looking to see what's happening next. Paul's not going... I don't know what's coming. I, oh, I, get, I get, think happy thoughts. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. That's not what Paul's doing. Paul's on the edge of his seat saying, I can't wait to see what God is going to do. Now we can be saying, well, Paul, do you not know? Do you not know what the possibility is? Absolutely. Look what he says. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always... So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Paul said, it doesn't matter how this plays out. Church, that's what joy will do to a person's life. It'll make you realize it don't matter how this plays out. What's the test results going to be? It don't matter. What if it's positive? Then God meant it to be positive. What if it's negative? God meant it to be negative. Paul says, whether I'm let go or whether I lose my head, it doesn't matter. I'm going to glorify Christ. He says, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. We're going to wrap it up right there. There's, there's one more point, but we can, we can pick that up. I'm learning we can do that. Is it okay if we do that? Some of you are like, yes, it's about time you learn that. You're praying for me. I'm growing. I'm growing. Speed it up, Gordon. Speed it up. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I want to challenge you this morning. If you're a believer, if you're born again, if you know Jesus as your Savior, if you don't, get with me after the service. It's real simple. I, 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 can, I can help you with that if you're interested, but... Wow, to be a believer. And I'm not trying to diminish what some of you are going through. Like I said, as the pastor of the church, I know some of your stories. I know what you're dealing with. I got things in my life and in my household. and so I know what that's like. But here's what I know. I know that God is working all things together for good. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss the opportunity. 
I don't want to get to heaven and the Lord say, hey, you remember that time when, when you got sick and you had to have that surgery and recovery took about two years? You remember that? Yeah, I, I remember that. And I didn't do so good with that, did I, Lord? No, no, you didn't. You, you, you complained most of the time and, and you murmured and whined about how life is just terrible and I had forgotten you. Yeah, I know. Let, let me show you what could have been. Oh, wow. Doesn't the Bible say he's going to wipe the tears from our eyes? Maybe. I don't know. Just maybe. Don't quote me on this, but just maybe. Maybe. Right? In a, in a brief little second, we might see what his plan would have been. I don't know. I don't know. I like to kind of think that way and challenge myself to, to realize that, wait a minute, God is at work. And this is not about the Keaton household. This is not about Solomon's porch. This is not about Pensacola, Scambia County, Santa Rosa County. This is not about the 2024 election. This is not about a submarine somewhere around the Titanic and how much they paid to do it. It's not about any of that. This is about one thing, church, and his name is Jesus Christ. It has always been about him. It is about him. And it always will be. Let's stand.